let's have a look at this case. Now, there's a 37-year-old multiparous woman who comes with the complaint of often non-bleeding after intercourse for the past four months. And the bleeding is uh, bright red in color, sort of spotting and typically painless. Now, what could be the possible differential diagnosis of this post-coital bleeding? Now, there can be a number of gynae causes, of course, but one should also keep in mind that there may be confusion with non-gynae causes, for instance, bleeding from other sources, like, for example, there can be bleeding from hemorrhoids, which um, happen to occur coincidentally after intercourse, and then that can be confused with a post-coital bleeding occurring from the vagina or from the cervix. So, postcoital bleeding is a sort of contact bleeding. So, we are suspecting some or the other lesion in the vagina or the cervix. The common gynecological conditions to consider as a part of differential diagnosis, one should keep in mind the possibility of trauma and that could account for some or the other episode of postcoital bleeding but a regular complaint like this one should also keep in mind the possibility of uh, vaginitis which can be atrophic vaginitis or it can be infective vaginitis the possibility of genital ulcerative lesions um, one should also keep in mind the possibility of um, decubitus ulcer which can happen on the prolapsed uh, cervix or the prolapsed um, a surface of the vaginal walls. Among the cervical causes, one should consider um, the possibility of cervical ectropion or cervicitis, which can happen uh, with or without uh, associated pelvic inflammatory disease. There can be cervical cancer and cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. There can be a cervical polyp. Now, the polyp could be an ectocervical polyp or an endocervical polyp or a fibroid polyp that tends to uh, protrude out of the cervical os. The possibility of endometrial cancer, endometrial polyp or endometrial hyperplasia or a submucous fibroid polyp could be considered. But then uh, they are less likely to cause post-coital bleeding by itself. They more likely present with uh, heavy menstrual bleeding or sometimes with irregular pattern of bleeding or maybe um, intermenstrual bleeding. But post-coital bleeding, typically one should think of lesions on the cervix or the vagina. So coming back to the case of this 37-year-old woman who came with the complaint of postcoital bleeding for the past couple of months, spotting sort of and uh, typically painless, there's no history of painful intercourse or any vaginal dryness or any vaginal uh, discharge or even, uh, you know, any pelvic pain. So we're less likely considering, you know, any pelvic inflammatory disease or any atrophic uh, vaginitis here so far. There's no history of something coming out of the vagina, uh, no history suggestive of prolapse. The menstrual cycles are otherwise regular 28-day cycles, bleeding lasting for about 4 to 5 days. There's no history of cervical cancer screening in the past, ever, and that's significant. Other than that, there is no other relevant medical or surgical history, no other relevant obstetric history as well. On per speculum examination, the cervix and vagina otherwise look healthy. There is a small endocervical polyp about a centimeter long. And now that we did a per speculum examination, at the same time, we also took a pap smear sample. Uh, since uh, this woman had never been screened for cervical cancer, we completed the examination, did a per vaginal exam, and the findings were absolutely normal as expected. And we recalled the woman later with the pap smear report. When she came back, the pap smear report showed high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. So now we're dealing with a 37-year-old multiparous woman with postcoital bleeding, with an endocervical polyp and a pap smear report of hyacinth. So what we did for her was a colposcopy. Now, colposcopy is an examination of the cervix which allows us to view the cervix under magnification. We apply 5% acetic acid on the cervix and then visualize any abnormal looking white area. So, let me show you the findings in this particular case. So, what we see here is 
you know, look at this. We are seeing the cervix under nine times magnification. This is after application of the acetic acid. We can see this endocervical polyp right here. And on application of acetic acid, it also turns uh, white. But all around the polyp, and look at the base of the polyp, we can see, um, you know, dark sort of white area with thick borders and underneath the polyp here as well we can see the white area with peeling off edges so this is all around the cervical os right here when we lifted the polyp up we can also see this abnormal white area with peeling edges so it's a thick white area all around the cervical os and the base of the polyp typically looks particularly white however there are no abnormal vascular patterns over this white area moving on further what we want to ensure is that we visualize the entire transformation zone and we also have to see how deep into the endocervical canal this white area is extending so what we do is we put in the endocervical speculum and we also see the inner margin of this white area so we are able to visualize the inner margin of the squamocolumnar junction so at least the inner margin of the transformation zone which is most important to visualize we are able to see here and we were able to visualize it uh, all around uh, the os as well at the same time so this is the white area right here as we can see and then uh, we also applied uh, lugol's iodine to look at um, uh, the um, abnormal area right here which is now turning yellow bright yellow so normal area appears uh, takes up the stain of iodine and appears mahogany brown whereas the abnormal area does not take up the stain of iodine and looks yellow so this is we're seeing the cervix uh, in five times magnified view here and we can see the abnormal yellow area so we do have identified the abnormal area right here so on colposcopy, we were able to see the acetovite area, we were able to see the transformation zone uh, completely, however, with some manipulation. So this is a type 2 transformation zone that we are dealing with. What we planned for her was a polypectomy, but along with a LEAP. LEAP is a loop electrosurgical excision procedure because now we have an abnormal pap smear report with an abnormal area with a symptomatic patient and yes, with an endocervical polyp at the same time. The LEAP and polypectomy specimen was uh, subjected to histopathological evaluation and the final report showed CIN3 in the LEAP specimen and the polyp was found to be a benign endocervical polyp otherwise. So what we see here in this case is the utility of performing and ensuring that there is a recent pap smear if not then performing a pap smear for the patient. Now this could be any sort of cervical cancer screening testing that is available to us. So you could have done a pap smear, you could, done, you could have done an HPV DNA testing or if not available, you could have done a visual inspection with acetic acid or a visual inspection with Legault's iodine as well. But such sort of patients do deserve some sort of cervical cancer screening if there is no such testing being done in the recent past. And also considering the fact that in Indian women, cervical cancer is the most common gynae cancer. And most of our women are not appropriately screened during their reproductive years as well. Now for this woman, had we only treated her endocervical polyp, thinking that that is the explanation for her postcoital bleeding, would have potentially missed out on the significant diagnosis of CIM3 in this particular case. And that is why screening, ensuring that there is a report available and then subjecting the patient to colposcopy helped us to give her the adequate treatment. So when we talk about the clinical approach to dealing with patients with postcoital bleeding, the evaluation has to be done in a step-by-step -step manner. It involves a thorough history taking, a thorough examination, and depending upon the examination findings, further investigations as deemed fit. For instance, testing for STI, sexually transmitted infections as indicated, cervical cancer screening should also be done. If abnormal, then the patient should be subjected to colposcopy. If there is a growth over the cervix, well, then in that case, uh, a punch biopsy can be done directly at the same sitting. If there is a suspicious looking cervix, one is not sure if it is cancer or not, then also colposcopy should be done. 
in case that the cervix is absolutely normal there is absolutely no doubt of any cervical pathology but the woman continues to have symptoms so with persistent symptoms or let's say she's also having associated intermenstrual bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding along with the postcoital bleeding one should consider a transvaginal sonography as well you could also consider a transvaginal sonography in case your clinical examination findings are suggestive of uh, any intrauterine pathology and based on this clinical approach once we are done with the thorough examination history taking and initial workup further evaluation is done as indicated now there is also a very good article in case you want to read further about postcoital bleeding it is from the obstetrics and gynecology tog from january 2022 now this is investigation and management of postcoital bleeding by ovens at all and this is a very good article it will help us in our clinical practice as well thank you so much